Hello students, welcome to today's class. I am Georgita Joseph and in today's class we will be dealing with the history of abnormal psychology. Now what is the history of abnormal psychology? It is the history of our discipline of psychology in fact because we must remember that psychology in a sense began in its earliest times with a focus on maladaptive behavior as to what could be done about it, how could we understand it and how could we treat it. Now in this lesson we will be having a number of names, a number of facts and we will try to make it as interesting as possible because in a way it is a story and we will be going about it story like and we will try to divide it into seven stages on a temporal basis from the earliest prehistoric times to our modern times. Let us begin with the earliest prehistoric times. Now how mental disorders were looked upon and treated and understood in earliest times is something we do not know much about. But whatever we know from writings that is Hebrews, Chinese, Greek and Egyptian writings is that our earliest forefathers looked at mental disorders in the same way they looked at all other phenomena they could not understand. They simply attributed it to some kind of supernatural cause. For instance, it may be planetary movements or the movements of stars or the configuration of some kind of cosmic bodies or the vengeance of God or the act of spirits. Now there is an interesting thing in the act of spirits there will be two kinds of acts. One is the act of the good spirits and the other of the demons. Now how did they distinguish it? If the mentally ill person showed some sort of behavior which was spiritual or religious, for instance he spoke something about the scriptures or about God, it was believed that he was possessed by a good spirit and strangely he was looked upon with awe and respect. On the other hand, if he became hyperactive, aggressive or used abusive language or behaved in ways that were devoid of social norms, then they decided that he was possessed by a demon. Now what was the treatment for such kind of demonic possessions? The primary treatment was exorcism. Exorcism meaning casting the devil out of the possessed person. Now there were a number of exorcistic techniques that were used. This included magic, incantation, prayers and even inhuman techniques such as flogging the person, starving the person, throwing him into hot or cold water and such other kinds of inhuman treatment. The basic aim of exorcism was to make the person's body an inhabitable place for the devil and to harass the devil out of the person's body. Now along with such kind of inhuman treatments, there were also some humane treatments for instance praying for the person in the community and allowing the person to go home and rest and so on. But what we must remember is that such treatments were very few. Now another major treatment in prehistoric times was trephination. Now what is trephination? Trephination involved drilling a hole into the skull of the possessed or mentally ill individual who was believed to be possessed in fact. Now why was this hole drilled? There were two reasons for it. The first was to reduce the pressure on the brain. Our forefathers felt that if the pressure was reduced the person would feel better. The second was to create an escape route or a window for the devil to go out of the person's head. So these were the two basic purposes of trephination and skulls which have been excavated from prehistoric times show that quite a number of mentally ill individuals were treated in this way. And there is another factor which is surprising that many of these individuals actually survived this primitive treatment because there, there is healing which can be seen around the refined skull. You can have a look at the picture which shows a refined skull and in many of the cases there is healing which indicates that the person actually survived. Whether he was cured or not is another question altogether. Now we have completed the first stage in the history of abnormal psychology. We are going on to the next stage and this involves early Greek and Roman thought. Now the evolution of a naturalistic approach towards understanding mental disorders, that mental disorders were not caused by supernatural causes but had natural causes. This understanding can be traced back in the earliest times to ancient Greece. Now the period of Greece under the Athenian leader Pericles was a golden age and it involved a lot of advancement in medicine. Now 
the ancient Greeks like other ancient cultures considered the human body sacred and so dissection of the human body in any way was prohibited and so whatever knowledge of human anatomy that physicians in those days had were based on their own experiences and understandings. They couldn't have a scientific analysis of the human body. In spite of this, there was surprising medical advancement in those times and there are three persons that we need to study in particular who belong to those times. One is Hippocrates, the other is Plato and the third is Plato's student Aristotle. Now coming to Hippocrates, we must have heard of him in other contexts as well and we know that he is rightly called the father of modern medicine. Now Hippocrates was the earliest Greek physician, a very influential physician, who said that mental disorders were not caused by supernatural causes. He said that they were illnesses of the body and mainly caused by brain pathology. He considered the brain a central element in the human system, a seat of intellectual thought and felt that damage to the brain can lead to mental disorders, which was a view quite advanced for his times. Secondly, Hippocrates also developed a classification system. See how ahead of his times he is. He classified mental disorders into mania, melancholia and phrenitis and above all, he kept detailed clinical records of his patients, how he observed them, how they behaved and how he treated them. Maybe the earliest form of the case history method that we as professionals today use. And he also considered the importance of dreams and in doing that, he was possibly the earliest harbinger of the psychodynamic theory of Freud. And the treatments also which he adopted for treating patients with mental illness were far humane as compared to what was practiced in his times. For instance, he prescribed a life of sobriety, a life of peace, give the patients tranquility, let them abstain from any kind of excesses, celibacy, a vegetarian diet, peaceful conduct, moderate exercise, all these were his treatments. But in spite of this, we, sh we should remember that Hippocrates was a person who lived in 460 to 377 BC. So it was but natural that some of his ideas were primitive. One of that was the theory of the four humors. He believed that there are four humors or fluids in the human body, that is blood, black bile, yellow bile, and phlegm, the combination of which determines the personality of the individual and pathological behavior. For instance, a person who has excess of blood will be happy, cheerful, and there will be frequent changes in mood. A person with an excess of black bile will be depressed and melancholic. A person with an excess of yellow bile will be quite irritable or choleric. And a person with an excess of phlegm will be sluggish, indifferent, and isolated himself. Now, this was a primitive theory, but as I said, we should understand the age in which Hippocrates lived. Secondly, he also recommended bleeding for balancing the fluid content of the body and treating people with mental disorders, which was also a primitive technique. And thirdly, he believed that certain diseases such as hysteria were limited primarily to women. And because he did not have much knowledge about human anatomy, he believed that hysteria was caused by the uterus traveling to the different parts of the body yearning for a child. And so he prescribed that marriage was the best medicine for it. So we see that certain ideas of Hippocrates no doubt are primitive, but we must remember that for his emphasis on brain pathology, for his humane treatments of mental disorders, for his classification and recording of mental disorders, for his understanding of the importance of dreams, we should understand that for all this, Hippocrates was a man who lived in prehistoric times, but whose thoughts were essentially in most ways of our times. Now the second Greek philosopher we need to understand in detail is Plato. Now Plato understood and emphasized that there were differences among individuals with regard to behavior and intellectual abilities. In his book, The Republic, he said that certain criminals who had committed criminal acts should not be punished in the way other criminals are punished because they are in fact mentally unstable. And because they are mentally unstable, they are not responsible for what they are doing. He also believed that mentally ill patients should be provided some kind of a hospital care, even a community care, 
which is a very modern philosophy we are dealing today in community psychology. Remember, he spoke of that in those times. He also understood the importance of sociocultural factors in mental illness. Today, we are trying to put forward those factors and urging that the DSM includes it, and he knew it at those times. And despite his modern views, Plato also was primitive in a sense that he believed that at least one part of the causation of mental disorders was divine or supernatural. A third influential figure is Plato's student Aristotle. Aristotle mainly followed the Hippocratic theory of the humors. He discussed the possibility of psychological factors such as frustration and conflict influencing mental disorders, but very wrongly he rejected the notion. And, but what is his most important contribution is that he understood the importance of consciousness and thought processes in influencing the individual's behavior and feelings. And he believed that if we think in certain directed ways, we can avoid pain and increase pleasure. So in a way, even though Aristotle wrongly rejected the psych possible psychological causation for mental disorders, in a way, by saying that thinking influenced feelings, sensations, and behavior, he was only contradicting himself and saying that mental disorders can have psychological causes. Now we have looked into the prehistoric times, we have looked into the early Greek and Roman thought, and now we go into the third stage that is the later Greek and Roman thought. Now some of the later Greek and Roman physicians, they continued Hippocrates' influential work, they continued on his lines and brought forward a more humane understanding and treatment of mental disorders. Now Alexandria and Egypt became the center of Greek culture and thought after Alexander the Great founded it in 332 BC. Now the temples dedicated to Saturn in Alexandria were excellent sanatoria or excellent hospital-like places for patients suffering from mental disorders. And you can have a look at what kind of wonderful therapeutic techniques they use there, something which probably we are not able to provide in these modern ages. The patients were provided with parties, music, dances. They could walk along the gardens, the temple gardens. They could row along the river Nile. They had musical concerts. They had therapeutic techniques such as hydrotherapy, warm massages, and all sorts of comfortable treatment. The main aim was to make the patient feel comfortable. Of course, certain undesirable practices such as starving the patient or bleeding or purging were followed, but the main focus was to make the patient comfortable. Now, one of the influential Greek physicians of this time and the person we'll be dealing with in this period in detail was Galen. Now, Galen was a Greek physician who practiced in Rome. As such, he did not contribute much to a greater understanding and treatment of mental disorders on a clinical basis, but he provided a great deal of impetus to understanding human anatomy. For instance, he was the first person to reveal that the human arteries did not contain air, but rather they contained blood. But this led to an increase in the unfortunate practice of bleeding. Of course, Galen must not have foreseen it and could not have understood the implications of it. Then another thing that Galen did was he took a scientific approach towards mental disorders and he did what something Aristotle had rejected. He classified the causes of mental disorders into both physical categories and psychological categories. If we have a look at the possible causes that he explained, it was adolescence, the changes and the turmoil of adolescence, menstrual changes, losses such as financial or economic losses, fear, injuries to the head, disappointment in love, all these factors are factors which we still accept as causes of mental disorder. Now, apart from Greek medicine, there is Roman medicine. Now, Roman medicine reflected the dynamism and the pragmatism of the Roman people. They were focused on making the mental patient feel comfortable and cared for. For instance, they used a lot of good physical therapies such as warm massages, hydrotherapy and the like. And one unique therapy was contraris contraris or opposite by opposite. They believed that it had some kind of effect. For instance, they would put the person into a warm bath and there he would drink chilled wine. Or probably he would be in a cold bath drinking some kind of hot soup. And so this was opposite by opposite, their treatment. So basically, even though we can see that many of the treatments are quite primitive, what must be understood is that there is a movement towards a humane treatment of mental illness and patients suffering from it. 
but again the later greek and roman thought is probably the end it marks the end of this kind of uh, positive thinking regarding mental behavior because after that we are going into the dark ages or the middle ages and during these middle ages all this progress which had happened among the Greeks and Romans it got shut down and in fact it regressed back into the primitive times. Now we come to the dark ages in the history of abnormal psychology the middle ages and we'll be dealing with the middle ages in two sections firstly we'll deal from 500 to 1500 AD and then the Renaissance and through the 16th and 18th centuries. Now coming to the first part, the Middle Ages from 500 to 1500 AD. As I've already mentioned, the Greek and Roman thinking and the advances that they had made in medicine was going into regression and going into a decline. But still, even though the Middle Ages were generally characterized by a lot of superstition and a regression back into the earliest times, the scientific aspects of Greek medicine surprisingly survived in the Islamic countries of the Middle East. The first mental hospital ever was established in Baghdad in 792 AD. And another person we need to understand in detail is the Persian physician Avicenna. He is one of the most influential physicians of his time, was known as the Prince of Physicians and also wrote the Canon of Medicine, which is in fact till today one of the most widely read medical works ever. Now, Avicenna frequently referred to a number of mental disorders such as hysteria, epilepsy, manic depression and depressive disorders. And he also took a unique approach towards the treatment of mental disorders. For instance, there is a small incident where Avicenna approaches a prince who feels that he is in fact a cow for slaughter and he keeps on demanding that they take him and slaughter him and make a feast out of his flesh. And since the courtiers and everyone refuses, the prince stops eating. He wants himself to be killed. And for Avicenna, look at him, he knows that the first thing to do is to restore the king to his normal the prince to his normal health and so he approaches the prince he accepts that he is a cow he says where is the cow bring him to me the prince comes forward and Avicenna feels him and says yes the cow needs to be slaughtered but the cow is not fattened enough he needs to eat a bit more so that we can have a big feast and immediately the prince starts eating and then there are different stages how he cures the disorder so have a look at the kind of unique approach Avicenna takes, what is more important and how to deal with each situation. Now, apart from this advance in Islamic medicine, the rest of the Middle Ages in Europe were mainly characterized by ritualism and supernaturalism and demonology. Now, treatments again went back to exorcistic practices, mild exorcistic practices such as taking the patient to the church or sprinkling him with holy water or getting the priest to bless him to uh, very inhuman exorcistic practices such as bleeding or starving or flogging and harassing the person so as to remove the devil from within. Now one thing we need to understand or something you must have already seen in the history of abnormal behavior is that in each period there is a lot of primitive thinking and there is progressive thinking as well. And so also in the Middle Ages which were generally the Dark Ages but there is a glimmer of hope because when we check English legal records, we see that they had recorded common sense explanations for people suffering from mental disorders. For instance, that either the person has an excessive fear of his father or some parental figure, that is why he's behaving in this way, or he had some kind of head injury because of which he has developed this disorder and so on. And also there are small evidences which indicate that mental illnesses were treated just like physical illnesses as an illness in the first place rather than as a demonic possession. Because in the paintings of ancient churches we can see saints, Catholic saints, healing the mentally ill along with people suffering from other illnesses such as the lame, the blind and the sick. So we can see that at least in certain cases they were treated on par with other sick people. Now there are two major features of this period, two interesting features of the Middle Ages. That is mass madness and lycanthropy. First we will deal with mass madness. During the latter half of the Middle Ages, there was this phenomenon in Europe where whole groups of people 
started getting mad or started behaving in an insane way together. For instance, there were manias of dancing, ranting, raving and convulsions happening to groups of people simultaneously. One of the earliest records of this was in 13th century Italy and there it was referred to as Tarantism. And people believed that people, groups of people were behaving in this way because they had been bitten by the tarantula or the wolf spider. And when it spread to Germany, that is later, it was referred to as St. Vitus's dance. And there was a lot of mania, dancing, ranting, raving that suddenly happened among groups of people. Now, what was the secret behind these, this phenomenon of mass madness? There are two possible reasons. Firstly, all this kind of dancing, ranting, raving and all these mysterious practices were in fact parts of orgiastic rites to please the Greek god Dionysus. Now, when Christianity came into focus, all these rites were banned and the focus was on the practice of Christianity. But even though these rites were banned and considered a sin, it was kept alive as a part of culture, not as a part of religion, but as a part of the person's culture. And there were secret gatherings where these practices were performed. Now, just to protect themselves from the blame of sin, people started saying that all this behavior can be attributed to some kind of madness or some kind of spider bite or some kind of St. Vitus's dance whereas this was in fact a cultural practice. And a second reason which we can see for mass madness is something different. Although mass madness continued up to the 17th century, it peaked in the 14th and 15th century. Now why did it peak is a question that researchers ask. Because this was also a period characterized by a lot of social upheaval, a lot of oppression, there were famines, there were plagues. In fact, the plague of Black Death happened during this time and such a lot of people died that almost 50% of the European population died during this plague. Now, all these conditions, the social oppression, the social chaos and the famines, all this created a sense of fear in the people and a fear and depression which caused them to believe that all this which was happening around them could not be attributed to any kind of natural cause. They felt it must be the revenge of God or the vengeance or some kind of punishment and it is beyond them to control it. So possibly the expression of a communal sense of depression and anxiety were these mass madness forms, some kind of escape where either to please the supernatural forces or to express their anxiety, they behaved in these ways. Now, another innovative mental illness that was seen during that time, if you can call it so, was lycanthropy, where the person believed that he was a wolf. Although he looked like a human being, he was a wolf, and they began to imitate the activities of the wolf. In fact, uh, one record shows that there was a person who told his captors or whoever were taking charge of him that he was a wolf, and his skin was smooth on the outside just because all the hair was on the inside and look at the treatment that was done, his extremities were cut off, that is his hands and legs were cut off and naturally the person died uncured. Now in the Middle Ages we have first seen how the Greek and Roman thought persisted in terms of the progress made in Islamic countries and the Islamic physician Avicenna. Then we saw how there was slight improvements and slight positive factors seen in English legal records. Then we had an understanding of two important phenomena, mass madness and lycanthropy. And now we come to another stage within the Middle Ages, which is a very long period. There are two prominent figures during this time. One is Martin Luther and one is Paracelsus and both their ideas contradict each other. Now Martin Luther, as we know, was the leader of the Reformation who brought forward the Protestant sect within Christianity and was known for his enlightened views. But strangely enough, he believed that mental disorders were caused by the possession of demons, which is quite unfortunate because for all his other progressive ideas, this was a very primitive idea. The other person in this time is Paracelsus, a Swiss physician who held views directly opposite to that of Martin Luther. He in fact emphasized that mental disorders were like any other illness. They were not caused by any kind of demonic possession or any kind of supernatural factors and hence 
should not be treated as such. He opposed all kinds of exorcistic and other similar practices. And another thing was that he was another harbinger of the psychodynamic concept because he saw mental disorders as some kind of conflict between our instinctual and our spiritual forces, what we feel are base primary instincts and higher levels of spirituality. Now, if you think closely, doesn't it look like the Freudian notion of the conflict between the id and the superego? Because the id is our instinctual force and the superego is our moral or higher spiritual force. So, in a way, Paracelsus was talking about the same thing centuries before Freud did. And another thing that Paracelsus did was introduce the concept of body magnetism, which later came to be known as hypnosis in the times of Freud, Dreyer and others. Now we come to the next stage in the history of abnormal psychology, the latter part of the Middle Ages, that is from the Renaissance, which peaked in Europe around the 15th century through the 16th, 17th and up till the 18th century. Now, during the Middle Ages, that is the beginning of the 16th century, the care and treatment of the mentally ill was mainly taken up by monasteries and the religious societies. And monasteries served as some kind of refuge and places of comfort for the mentally ill. Now, there were two kinds of treatments followed. A majority of the treatments were more or less humane because even if they included exorcistic practices, it included something like visits to holy places, touching relics or some kind of material from the saints, or the breath and the spittle of priests, laying of hands or blessing by the priests, use of holy water, holy oil and so on which were influenced by Christian practices. However, more harsh methods were also used in case the mental disorder was far advanced. For example, they may be flogged, starved, beaten and harassed to remove the devil within. So something we have known earlier, the typical practices. Now, this practice was also influenced in some sense by the medical approach put forward by Galen, although the people of the time did not really understand what it was. So if we have an example of the kind of treatment given to a fiend sick man or a man with the possession of a demon, it is a kind of mixture of all kinds of treatments. For instance, they are saying give him a concoction or a fluid consisting of plants such as bishop's wort, henbane, lupin and garlic pounded together and to that what they are adding is ale or beer and holy water. So a mix of religious and medical practices. One of the main evidences of the time come from Johann Weyer, a German physician who analyzed and studied a great deal about mental disorders and this current practice of witch hunting which was going on during his time. And in response, he published a book, The Deception of Demons, which contained a step-by-step -step rebuttal of the Malus Maleficarum, which in fact was a handbook which guided people how to identify and how to treat and execute witches. And in this book, he put forward that many of the people who were being executed as witches were in fact mentally ill and in no way responsible for their activities. Now, his book met with a lot of appreciation from certain outstanding physicians of his time. But as usual, most of the common people, including the clergy and including the political class, totally isolated him. They made fun of his book. And in fact, he was referred to as Verus Hereticus or some kind of blasphemer or Verus Insanus, which means that he himself was insane. Now, if you think that Weir was the only person who got such a reward for putting forward an influential and progressive view, then you are wrong because to follow suit soon was Reginald Scott, an Englishman who also put forward the same view as Weir and he pointed out in his book, The Discovery of Witchcraft, that witch hunting in fact was a hunting down of the mentally ill. And the reward he received for it was that he was castigated and banished by King James I. Now, there are two other progressive thinkers of this time. One is St. Teresa of Avila, a Catholic nun who was later canonized by the Catholic Church, who put forward that mental illness was not caused by any supernatural cause and was just like physical illness. 
The another influential figure was Saint Vincent de Paul because he was a part of the Catholic clergy. He was a part of the church and yet risking his life and his reputation, he put forward that mental disorders were in no way different from physical disorders and that Christianity demanded a humane treatment and understanding of mental disorders. Now, what we should learn in this huge period of the Middle Ages is that, of course, there, it was a dark age, there was a lot of superstition, a lot of ritualism. But again, there are beacons of light in the form of Reginald Scott, in the form of St. Therese of Avila, in the form of St. Vincent de Paul, or in the form of Johann Weyer, who risked their lives, who risked their reputation to put forward a progressive view of mental disorders. And it is their efforts which laid the foundation for the modern empirical study of mental disorder that we have today.